Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Libraries in Response, Session 72, AI and the Future of Human Agency. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, open collaboration of, of tech innovating libraries, uh, and uh, the producer of the, the series for three years now since the pandemic began. Uh, our sessions are hosted and recorded by IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and institutions based in The Hague, their longtime ally in the pursuit of universal public access. And our session sponsor today is the Urban Libraries Council, who has uh, uh, been a, a leading uh, agency in pursuit of understanding this, this topic today. And we're, we're really happy to have them. Uh, <clears throat> This, uh, this quote, AI is a huge harbinger of social change and libraries must be part of it uh, by David Leonard, who's going to act in, uh, in re as a respondent to our speakers today. Uh, couldn't agree more, uh, David. Thank you very much. Uh, Lee Rainey, the director of uh, the Pew Center for uh, Internet and Technology, and Fiona O'Connor, senior service specialist uh, at uh, Toronto Public Library. Uh, we had another a prior uh, session on AI. Uh, we had our first one actually with Pam Ryan from Toronto uh, PL uh, last year. Uh, library responses to big AI, something we called AI. It was all big AI. Uh, it still seems to be, but maybe that's also changing. And then just uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, another AI session, Boone or Doom, led by David Lankus of the University of Texas High School. And uh, uh, well, not unlike the uh, the, the Canvas uh, project that uh, Lee is going to report on, kind of divided opinion about what all this signifies. Um, this is a uh, uh, I'll, I'll put this in the chat, but this is a, 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 a brief from ULC recently that, you know, kind of sets this up and um, uh, and hopefully everybody can uh, get something from that. It's uh, what what is the role of libraries? What's the significance of libraries in relation to this phenomena, which, you know, how how big is this thing? Some people say, well, it's just another, you know, kind of a new technology. It's, 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 these are, these are not really uh, autonomous agents. Uh, they're just mimicking things. Well, okay, but <laughs> what, what actual agency do they have? What can they do? Well, uh, according to Ames here, uh, looks like they can do a lot. Um, this is this is kind of a strange uh, quote, and I don't really know what what they mean when it what hits the fan. Do they mean AI hits the fan? I suspect a lot of these people are thinking that maybe climate change is hitting the fan, and they want a place uh, to bug out to. But nevertheless, it's it's I agree. There's some serious things going on here. Um, the advances are accelerating, and uh, this quote from the uh, canvas from from Lee's report, uh, vastly expanding their capabilities and to tackle complex problems. But how vast, I think, is, is the question. How complex are these problems? So we're going to uh, find out more about this. And uh, we're happy to have you, Lee to uh to walk us back through this this uh canvas you call it not a survey not uh, not a uh, a formal survey but the the interviews that that you had with a number of uh authorities i guess we can call them and then we'll uh go to fiona who will tell about the the program that she's leading there for toronto which is very much related to uh um uh, digital literacy with emphasis on this particular technology and then David will be acting, uh, responding, and leading the discussion there. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Lee. Thank you, Lee. And uh, please tell us what's up. 
So it's it's great to, to be here. And if, if you've uh, heard anything from the Pew Internet Project over the years, you've heard um, my gratitude and thanks for the library community and the many, many ways it has been primary stakeholders of the work that we have put out, both in, in big nationally representative public opinion surveys of adults and, and teenagers in the United States. The thing I'll be talking about today is, is not one of those. Um, and I am uh, grateful to a, a bunch of librarians who have also participated in this. We, we call it a canvassing because we have a big database of experts who, have, who think about the future or analysts of technology. Sometimes they're pioneers and builders of technology. And uh, it's a non-scientific sample, but we get uh, usually several hundred, sometimes a couple of thousand experts responding to questions we ask about the future. In this case, we're asking about AI and its uh, a likely impact in the future on human agency and human autonomy. Uh, we did the survey last summer. Uh, so it was actually, it was certainly in the era of GPT-3, but it was before chat GPT came into being and certainly before chat uh, GPT-4 uh, was embedded in, in these systems. And yet, you know, there were plenty of people in our canvassing who were already aware that these generative models were, were coming into life, that they were gonna have stupendous applications. Uh, and, and, and pose uh, big questions to the, the, the future of, of so many human endeavors, not least of which is the way we create and acquire and, and search for uh, information. So the primary business of libraries is deeply implicated in the arrival of all sorts of systems of artificial intelligence, but particularly in these large language models that are represented by GPT. PT3, 4, and, uh, and other large language systems. And, and it's so interesting during the course of our work, we, we went into business in 2000, started doing our work, and it was immediately clear when we released our first reports about broadband and its arrival in American homes. And this was before mobile connectivity and before the rise of social media in its modern iteration. Librarians became the, almost the primary, or certainly among the most important stakeholders of our work. They instinctively knew that changes in communication, information provision and creation were important uh, it, it, for their lives, important for them to understand, important for them to, to um, master because it was gonna be the way that people were going to be operating in the world. And the arrival of AI systems the systems that uh, the wonderful analyst uh, Kevin Kelly calls the Ur force of our future. Librarians knew uh, instinctively that this was gonna be a big uh, impact on, on their world and the kinds of things that they did. So this report uh, we issued uh, in, in the fall and uh, we, we got 540 of our experts, uh, a, a really interesting mixture of analysts, uh, academics, as well as practitioners and builders and pioneers uh, to respond to the question about, look, going ahead to the year 2035, more or less a decade from now, um, would AI systems, smart machines, bots and systems be designed to allow humans to easily control decision-making that mattered to them uh, by that out year, by the year 2035, or will these systems not make uh, humans nearly as, as much in control of the key decisions of their lives as they currently feel that they are? There was a sort of meta story that was included, that was uh, sort of overarching all of, all of the answers that people gave in this, that essentially is AI is here to stay. It's here to become at least a co-pilot or a sidekick to human beings. Then certainly by the year 2035, there will be AI gadgetry, AI systems embedded in our technology and digital systems and AI features in, in lots of the machinery and tools and appliances and at, at environments that we're in. And at a minimum, AI systems are going to um, you know, sit on our shoulders, sit in our hands, uh, sit in our brains, sit in our purses, and, um, and be assistants, be, uh, be, enable people to access more and more information, ac access more and more expertise, access more and more um, insights from the world around them, including insights drawn from history insights drawn from current debates and things like that. So that, that's a given really for the world ahead. And it's why, you know, you all are, are 
anxious to be hearing about this and, and sessions like this are, are potentially highly useful to you. So under that meta story though, uh, we, we really found sort of a split verdict and 56% of the experts in our sample said human agency is at risk. 44% said it'll, a human agency will, will survive the, this onslaught just fine. We consider that a split verdict. It, these, these are non-scientific samplings. We depend on people um, self-selecting into our surveys and things like that. So we're not treating this as a highly statistically um, important set of findings other than um, giving insights for, uh, from, the, from, from people's answers about whether they thought things would work out for the better or for the worse. And um, what we outlined in the report are uh, three big themes from, uh, from those who are worried and worried that human agency is increasingly at risk as AI propagates through our gadgetry and our systems in the world. Uh, the three um, the themes that came from the people who are um, uh, nervous, uh, if not um, scared out of their minds, were the following. Um, they, they talked about the powerful interests that are building AI systems, both in, in, in companies and in governments, and how they have little incentive as they're building the systems to honor human agency. The, they argued that these tools and platforms uh, that the public increasingly depends on will be operated or influenced by elites, uh, both at the, at the highest levels of industry as well as at the highest levels of government who have little incentive to design them to allow humans to exert more control in their lives. It's um, one possibility that emerges from this is that digital divides uh, the tech uh, savvy class from the, from the tech less savvy class is going to result as well as sort of the way that these systems become embraced by people in their adoption patterns. Divides are going to potentially get worse according to these experts. A second negative theme was that humans um, themselves, the users of these technologies, uh, value convenience and will continue to allow black box systems to make decisions for them. Uh, they made the case that, uh, the, that people already allow invisible algorithms to influence some, some of the things that they, they decide, and I put that in quotes really because it's not necessarily anybody deciding what's showing up in their newsfeed other than the algorithm of social media companies. Um, and, but, but humans are, are perfectly happy to, in many cases, to default to what the algorithms give them, and that, that won't change. And a primary driver of this, of course, is convenience itself. As these systems prove their worth and prove their value um, in the marketplace and in just the everyday lives of people, um, they will be their, the value of what they're delivering will outweigh whatever concerns people have about the autonomy they have to make decisions or even the data that they're sharing to allow these systems to deliver um, goods and services to them. So there are ways in which humans are off, potentially offered control of, of these systems, um, but they more or less default to, um, to using the systems, using the convenience of the systems to get the things that they want. It's a common story we've seen as the internet and more and more rudimentary digital systems play out in their lives and it'll certainly come that way now in the AI world. The final theme of the negatives on the negative side of this is that um, some really smart people were arguing that the scope and the complexity and the cost and the evolution of these systems are simply too confusing and overwhelming, even to their creators sometimes, to enable users to assert agency. In other words, so many intervention points would have to be built into these systems, and so many particular things for personalized use of these systems might have to be built to give people agency that it's just literally impossible to design the systems in ways that would allow people control over their decision making over them. That's a pretty scary thought. Those who are more upbeat, who say that you know, the systems will allow humans to stay in control of the main decisions, also uh, we highlight three of the things that they were giving. Um, they point out to history. They say humans and technology have always evolved positively. There are enormous disruptions that occur as the Industrial Revolution played out, for instance, that were really um, wrenching to societies and individuals. But eventually, new equilibriums set in place and, uh, and the technology is adapted in, in useful ways by humans and humans come normalize its use in ways 
and there, there will constantly be iteration, and particularly in the case of digital systems, there were design ethics and social norms and other sensibilities will be embedded in them. And, and that history lesson is one that will play out here. Second negative, uh, second positive thing is that there, it, there's these folks were arguing that businesses and governments have no incentive to, um, to annoy their customers and to threaten their citizens. So they, ha they have to develop tools and systems in ways that allow people to make the decisions that they want and have the authority and autonomy they want because they will just not survive um, either as, as political entities or as, as market entities if they are so um, at odds with the people who are going to be using their systems. And then there was a sort of the final thing was a sort of balance sheet argument. Sure, there are going to be negative things, some of these analysts argued, but there are also going to be positive things too. And the, uh, the weight of, of the positive stuff will be greater than the weight uh, of the negative stuff. Uh, and so those are the main themes. I, I just want to highlight a couple of answers because I thought they were so brilliant and, and, and insightful here. Paul Sappho, one of the... Um, you know, great gurus from Silicon Valley and, and observers out there from the Institute of the Future, he teaches at Stanford and places like that. He made the argument that those who manage our synthetic intelligences, in other words, those who build AI, will grant you just enough agency to keep you from noticing your captivity. Jamey Cassio uh, is also a sort of wonderful analyst who's regularly contributed to these uh, reports. And he argued that there were ways in which um, the systems would, which there were scenarios basically to, um, to, to be thinking about. And um, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna hunt for his answer in the report because it was so, it was so brilliant. He talked about uh, three, three likely classes of people that would emerge from, from the application of these systems. He said there one class, probably the dominant number of people would be humans who believe they're in control, but they are not. A second class, would, a smaller class would be humans who do not know they, are, who, who know they are not in control, but they're okay with that. In other words, the systems serve them okay enough and they don't wanna fight them. And then a third class, a really small number of elite folks, he said, will be a limited number of AI augmented humans who do have control of their lives and do have control of the way these systems play out in their lives. And he talked, he actually sort of violated the question by thinking about the year 2045. And he said, by then, there might be three possible outcomes. Uh, one he called, no AI, no cry. He said, maybe things go so wrong in the next 20 years uh, with AI and, and the way it disrupts human beings and the way that it disallows human agency and autonomy that we will have essentially gone back in the past and, and removed many, if not most AI systems from our lives because we, they just can't be trusted. The second scenario you talked about was we'll all be watched over by machines of loving grace. These are AI systems that are relatively benign, it's, uh, it's, they've taken our interests into account. They do the things that we want them to do. And, and it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a wonderful um, world with AI sort of uh, at the top of the mountain. And the third, of course, he talked about was an age of digital dictators. There are so many ways in which these tools can be put to the um, purposes of um, authoritarians and, and uh, sort of uh, folks who, are, who don't have anybody's um, well-meaning uh, in their minds, that's the problem that we can that we can anticipate. So a whole lot of stuff to consider, and I'm going to pass it back to you, John. I can uh, jump right in, um, oh, Lee, if ahead. that's okay, Don. Um, the um, one of the biggest questions that appears to be on on the table right now is whether this is a continuous evolution of technology and you know, smarter and smarter uh, algorithms, or whether there's a discrete jump that has, has happened or is in the process of happening right now. Um, there've been three recent articles that um, I'll drop in the chat in a little bit, but I'm sure you're familiar with or familiar with the um, concept behind them. Thomas Friedman in the New York Times has referred to this as a Promethean moment largely because he got a demonstration recently of ChatGPT and what the possibilities actually are. 
Um, the second uh, one that I would cite is, is Bill Gates' own uh, blog post around that we are entering now formally the age of AI. And, and the third is the call yesterday, which I know Fiona may want to talk about a little bit as well, is uh, a call for a halt from people like Steve Wozniak and many, many technology leaders across the industry. So, Lee, do you have any um, opinion or sense from the, the canvas that this is really more of a discrete jump that we're facing rather than a continued evolution? The, the folks in the canvassing were quite convinced that this is a breakaway, breakout moment. And, and But rather than thinking it as a sort of um, you know, digital Cambrian um, explosion, the, the, a lot of them referred to the sort of evolution that comes, but comes in logarithmic uh, at a logarithmic pace rather than a sort of straight up linear pace. That, that there are ways in which the applications of these tools are, are likely to be so broad, so pervasive, so disruptive, um, but they come from this, the, the sort of greater, greater strength. I mean, just the strength between GP, uh, the passage between GP, T three and four, you know that lots of people who are road testing uh, the the newer versions with GPT four are to, are noticing that in less than a year, you know, ChatGPT was released on November thirtieth. So in, in a couple of months, the GPT three version and the GPT four version are are pretty substantially different. So there's a there's a sense, yeah, we're at a moment that's a disruptive moment in the same way that the arrival of the internet was. But there's also a sense that this is that this is now the new sort of um, pattern of evolution. Yeah, and I think uh, we'll, we'll hear again in a moment about um, algorithmic literacy as a way of responding to this opportunity. Uh, but the human agency piece of your work uh, and, and paying attention to that appears to be one of the mo most significant takeaways uh, from from your work in this moment. Um, are there suggestions on what we can do about that? Uh, you know, the, the, this this opportunity on those three negatives about the scope is too great. We we, pre we really prefer convenience over um, over values, um, and that no one's building this with the human element in mind. Uh, that's kind of more of a gloom and doom approach. So I'm just wondering if you think there are opportunities to uh, reclaim a piece of the of the landscape here. Well, I think particularly these experts would take comfort from the fact that the conversation about ethical AI has been going on for multiple years now. And there are dozens of efforts around the world, not only to articulate the ethical regimes that might be applied to AI, but are also sort of deeply testing existing systems for things like bias, for things like ethical, other kinds of ethical shortcomings and stuff. So I, I, I'm not sure that there's ever been a period quite like this where technology is rolling out and the and the backlash or that where the sort of critical uh, inspection of it is as intense as it was. You might remember the early days of the internet, it was you know flower power for everybody. And it was gonna be great. And there were there might be some dark side parts of it, but it was gonna be manageable and and the glory of it would far outweigh um, the, the whatever harm might come from it. I think we, you know, a lot of people, particularly in our database of experts, have learned from the rollout of the internet that soon enough the forces of evil and the forces of ill and the, and the mischief makers and, and even the systems themselves produce results that nobody wants. And so I think there's a there's an earlier set of interventions here that call for a pause. It's part of it. There's a lot of talk maybe about a, an FDA for algorithms. So you get sort of a medical regime applied to testing and and um, and having a regime of of sort of um, benchmarks to go through before algorithms are released in the wild. So there's a there's a whole bunch of talk that's a lot more current now than it ever was in in days gone by in the internet and God knows before that in days gone by the industrial revolution. I'll ask one more question and then I'll ask Don to introduce Fiona so we can go to the second part of our uh, of our conversation today. Um, um, Lee, I, I'm always concerned when we see new developments in technology, um, whether, yeah, I'm not going to go all the way back to the printing press and the Industrial Revolution, but certainly the interconnected nature of our world, um, the power of uh, accelerated processing, all of which speak to the world that, that has become possible. But there's always a divide. You know, there's 
digital divide in in, in the West, in our uh, global North, in our what we used to call the developed world. Uh, but this also has implications for our global society. The promise of a utopian global world never really materialized. And um, is this going to be something else that, that uh, is it an opportunity to bridge that divide globally or is it actually in danger of making things worse? Both, yes, and uh, and so what? Well, I'll tell you about a piece of research we did during um, during the pandemic. When vaccines were first being rolled out, we asked about um, you know the use of digital systems to get access to them and to sign up for them and to find out where they were and things like that. And we only asked two questions about digital literacy, but they turned out to be enormously revealing. The first question was, do you feel like you? Uh, need help when you're working with your gadgets and how confident are you to, to get the information you want from the internet? If you answered yes to either one of those questions, which is about 30% of internet users, so they have the technology and they have access to it, but they're not quite sure how fluent they are in it, they really struggled uh, just getting access to the, to the information about where to get vaccines. They depended on others to help them get into those systems. And so there, there are ways in which now sort of a whole new set of literacies is now uh, coming into play. And sure, there are gonna be divides related to this. I think, you know, the, the, the IFLA and, and Don's group are, are gonna be um, in the vanguard of making sure that folks don't get too terribly um, harmed by, by all of this stuff, but it's, it's, it's gonna happen. Thank you. I think digital literacy is a great uh, point uh, segue to transition to, to Fiona. So I'll ask um, Don and Fiona to come back and then we'll uh, be back with everybody a little bit later in the hour. Thank you, David. And thank you, Lee. Uh, excellent uh, report. I, I hope everybody has a chance to read it and we'll uh, look again afresh. What occurs to me is, uh, Lee, that that this is this technology seemed to be emerging as uh, something like a universal interface. It's how we will interact with basically all digital technologies because it's going to be embedded in everything. So, like the way we get services on a you know phone tree and you know, all the things that are going to be AI uh, uh, controlled, we're going to be interacting through that, whether it's voice or text or whatever. And that will, as technology does, that will shape our behavior, what it allows us to do, what it perceives we want. Uh, so I, I think this is really huge myself. I think it's a vast thing. Uh, the ethics are <laughs> as complicated as the technology. Uh, and, you know, it's worrisome to see even uh, companies abandoning their, their AI ethics groups. I wonder if they're just doing that for liability. <laughs> you know, well, we just don't know. We've never thought about that, so we're not liable for it. But it's uh, it's really it's really uh, uh, impressive how how amazing it is. And what's the, the old saying? Uh, Anything worth doing is worth overdoing. And it, it just seems like that's the way we treat everything that comes up. Any new technology, there's always somebody that's trying to weaponize it. And so this is certainly going to fall into that. Um, and my 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 question, I'll I'll just leave this hanging. We'll go to Fiona. Is if if these models, uh, I think the current models right now are, are trained on pre twenty one subset of the internet, so not current events yet, uh, quite. But if if they are generating content, which they are and they do, but it's an unreliable content. It has not been curated, so. This is this is automated process. So is the internet going to become flooded with dubious? I mean, it's already kind of marginal content, but is it going to like exponentially be increased by AI generated, un uh, unsubstantiated content from which it will draw? It's it will be part of the model that's drawing from. It's the open internet. So it looks like a spiral to a hellscape uh, from, from that standpoint. Uh, with that, Fiona, I'm going to welcome you <laughs> and, and uh, most interested in how you are, um, how the Toronto Public Library is bringing people into this conversation because 
I mean, it gets ultra technical, but at the same time, we all operate in this digital environment or, you know, nearly all of us. And, and so how much awareness do we need and what can libraries play in that? Or, or really what's the background for the program that you set up and what are the different branches for? Anyway, just please tell us what's going on up there. Unmute and welcome Fiona. Oh, thank you. Um, to kind of give you a little bit of background of what I do, um, I am a senior service specialist in digital literacy initiatives. So my my area of focus is um, in new technologies. So artificial intelligence, um, big data, um, open data, um, digital privacy, data privacy, and so on. So I develop um, I develop programs as well um, for the public, as well as staff training um, for um, for our system. Um, so Toronto Public Library is quite large. Um, we have 100 branches, um, you know, over well over 2,000 employees, and um, so yeah, it's um, these are these are big shoes, right? Um, we have a we have a big job ahead of us. Um, so I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes um, just going over. I have a slide presentation um, of the programs that we are. Um, have developed and are developing. And I'm just going to share my screen. And this is where I'm like, hope everything works out well. <laughs> How's that? Can you see? Can you see my screen? We're seeing your presenter view. Or OK, there, there, we, there, there you go. go. Right? OK, perfect. Thank you so much. OK. I'm just going to move me and bring up the chat so I can see what's going on. Okay, so um, thank you, um, Don, for bringing me into this brilliant conversation today. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity um, to talk about how the Toronto Public Library is educating our citizens in the area of artificial intelligence. Um, I am pleased to be here with, um, with Lee Rainey and David Leonard, thank you, um, to speak on this very important topic. Okay, so to dive into artificial intelligence programs. So as we, as we see, it is literally everywhere. Um, and um, I, I did get a chance to read that hefty report, um, The Future of Human Agency, um, and something did jump out at me where I was like, you know, saying my, my, um, my triumphant yes, um, but every human needs um, education in what tech-fueled decision-making is and what decision tech can and does make on its own. So TPL recognizes this need and is on the path to educating um, our citizens and what it is, um, and this is crucial in building an aware society. So programming in AI specifically began in 2019, um, and we started off in the class um, in algorithmic literacy and understanding how algorithms work um, and the biases that it can create. Now, seeing the need um, to explain AI, we have developed an in-house introductory program on what is artificial intelligence. So this program actually launched um, earlier this week. Um, the program covers what is artificial intelligence, um, how AI learns and predicts outcomes. So this section really dives into um, data, machine learning and biases and AI. Um, and then how the internet of things applies to AI. And of course, sprinkled in throughout the program are discussion questions. Um, so it's a time to pause and think about how AI impacts our life um, and what concerns do you have with it? Um, so this is um, an introductory program. We will be building on this, but um, this is part one, I should say. Okay, now coding, um, uh, an important component 
in building AI applications. Um, so over the years, uh, TPL has offered Python classes. Um, and as we know, Python is a wonderful um, open source programming language that's used for creating web applications, web content, um, mathematics, system scripting, and so on. But it's the number one code for building AI models. Um, so TPL offers an intense 75 hour course through Cisco networking that equips learners with the tools that they need to prepare for the Python Institute's um, PCAP certified associate for um, in Python programming exam. So, but seeing the need um, for a more introductory class, because this is quite intense, that 75 hour one, we developed an in-house um, program um, and currently we offer a two-part um, series. And in this course, you're gonna learn how Python code works, um, be given time to practice. Um, Python, um, you don't need to know Python before taking this. This is, this is introductory. Um, the key takeaways include um, working knowledge of variables, um, loops, um, conditional arguments, um, and much, much more. Um, part two is a more advanced class that offers um, programming exercises and more challenging functions and modules. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, IoT technologies, they're advanced. Um, so connecting with experts is a way of uh, forming partnerships to bring incredible information to our communities. Um, so the next couple of slides um, will outline how we work with community agencies, government institutions, educational institutions to bring in experts um, to discuss AI technologies. So I'll begin with um, Keith McDonald, um, founder of Literacy AI. Um, this is a citizen focused effort devoted to artificial intelligence. Um, so I've worked with Keith for um, over the years. The, the first series um, was artificial intelligence and the new abnormal. So this was a five part um, series that explored AI experiences, how it influences social media, um, ethical AI, and lastly, looking at AI on both sides of the coin. Um, last year, we ran um, a five-part series, um, Building a Better Human Being Using AI. Um, so the series explored how AI can help us live up to our potential. So the series looked at um, evolution, health, work, play, and conflict. So working with, um, with our cultural programming team, um, we launched an I on AI series um, late in 2021. Um, and the programs are designed to ask important questions related to AI and machine learning technology and its uses and privacy impact on our lives. So um, pictured um, in this slide was our very first panel discussion um, that focused on equity and inclusion in AI. Um, and additional programs were about the future of AI and, and, and biases in AI. So this year, the series is going to continue and we're gonna concentrate on AI and art. Um, so programs are gonna cover um, fiction writing, moving pictures, um, music creation, visual arts. So quite excited about that series continuing. Now, TPL had um, a fantastic opportunity to connect with MIT Libraries. Um, we partnered in an online um, panel discussion, Decoding the Bias, that explored the need to create an inclusive and equitable artificial intelligence system and how to mitigate underlying biases embedded in data sets and algorithms as highlighted in the documentary film, Coded Bias. So um, the panel of experts featured um, Sasha Constanza Schock, um, Director and, of Research and Design, from the Algorithmic Justice League, um, Shalini Kantaya, Filmmaker and Director of Coded Bias, um, 
We also had um, Kishana Peck, Executive Director, um, Toronto Women X in Data Science, and um, Sophia Noble, Co-Director, um, UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. Um, now, this was moderated by Ethan um, Zuckerman, Associate Professor of Public Policy um, from the University of Massachusetts um, at Amherst. Now, um, prior to this a public facing program, um, we actually gathered um, several staff members from both TPL and MIT library um, to on a virtual lunch and learn to discuss coded bias and the role that academic and public libraries have um, in artificial intelligence. Um, so it's really to identify and combat um, I'm kind of going to go back a little bit here um, to help communities build knowledge about AI technologies and skills to identify and combat misinformation and disinformation. So now in 2022, um, so at the end of last year, towards the end of last year, Toronto Public Library invited applicants with experience in artificial intelligence to fill the role of our um, innovator in residence. So the IR for short um, delivers programs, um, workshops, one-on-one um, -on -one consultations about artificial intelligence and to help learners understand how AI is used and how it affects our day-to-day -day living. So we hired um, Kishana Peck, um, founder and CEO of Toronto um, Women X in data science. Uh, and Kashana delivered 30 amazing programs, several one-on-one -on -one appointments, uh, and staff training opportunities um, that reached over 290 participants. So programs consisted of topics such as responsible AI, self-driving cars, um, artificial intelligence, and health. Um, and a collaborative program with um, Innovator and in Resident in Music Theory um, and technology, Jason Cullimore, um, and this program was about songwriting and AI. So this particular IAR was um, divided into three areas, um, which was product inclusion design labs, um, lunch and learn sessions, and a data lit series. So the following slides will we'll go over those parts. So first was the product um, inclusion design labs, and this equipped participants with frameworks on how to design um, process of various AI systems and products and an inclusive and ethical AI model is key in removing biases. So each section focused on technology and inclusion challenges for different um, equity seeking groups and the sessions included many discussions to help you reimagine the design process and outputs. So the last program in the series was an opportunity for participants to actually present a mock-up of an inclusive AI powered technology. So we also had lunch and learn sessions, um, and this was an hour devoted to a theme of artificial intelligence. Um, so the themes were ethics, autonomous vehicles, ed tech, responsible AI, health, finance, songwriting. We, um, there was many guest speakers that came in um, for these sessions um, to give their input as well. And the residency also included a data lit series. So um, participants actually had the opportunity to explore three books, um, of course, on the theme of artificial intelligence. Um, the books that were explored were Prediction Machines by AJ Agarwal, um, Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, and Data Feminism by Catherine Dignazio and Lauren F. Klein. Now, um, the following are direct quotes from participants um, that have taken our programs. Um, I won't go through all of them. I'll just highlight the first one here that's on the screen. 
um, that we need to raise awareness of the implementation of AI, particularly in non-transparent government projects so that we can ask informed questions and engage with those decision-making processes that shape those projects. And then, of course, um, the survey that we um, that we put out, um, we asked for ideas, feedback, right? How should we go forward? Um, so here are a few ideas of um, for future programs. Um, and I won't go through all of them here, but um, the first one I will highlight um, more interviews with AI, MI, data science professionals from various industries to better understand innovations of the future from um, information technology perspectives. And that brings me to the end of, um, of my presentation. And thank you. Um, we have a lot to do here um, with the advancements um, in AI technologies. And, and we're doing our, our very best to educate our citizens in this complex topic. Um, and it requires deep learning in our part, as well as connecting with brilliant minds that are out there in the industry. So thank you for this opportunity. And I am going to um, take your questions. Uh, thanks, you. Fiona. Um, that, that's uh, uh, amazing work. I, I've long respected our colleagues at Toronto Public Library for being leaders in this particular arena of technology training, digital literacy, and coining, I think, I think it might even have been one of your team members or your, your head, Vickery, who referred to this as algorithmic literacy. I, I thought that particular approach really gave insight into what the opportunity and challenge challenge is here. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if you and your work, same questions I asked Lee, think this is a, a really discrete jump we're facing right now, or whether this is more of a continuous evolution of technology challenges and opportunities? Oh, I think um, I think it's an evolution. I think this is a forever. So we, we just have to um, uh, keep our eyes on what's, what's moving and develop and connect with, um, with our experts um, and keep pumping out that information. That's, I think, that is a forever situation. And you're, you're inter interacting with, with many different um, members of your public on this topic. Um, I, I would love to know if you're finding, um, are, are people coming because they wanna just learn what this is all about? Do they wanna learn the technical skills themselves so maybe they could follow a career or uh, explore this as a hobby? Or is there interest in, just the broader societal questions around the implications of AI. It may very well be that it's a little of all of that, but I'd love your thoughts on those on the, those questions. It it really is all of the above, um, and um, I think most of us know we're you know, and from the library perspective, we get we get everyone right. We get people who come in who do not know the subject, and they. That they're they're curious about it, um, or um, we get we get people who come in who know quite a bit, and they really want to talk and they want to use the library as a platform to really broadcast their thoughts, which is why these programs are so important um, for those rich discussions. I I absolutely love it when I run a program and I actually have all of that in the audience. So I have the people who are like, I haven't a clue to, I have so much to say. And it's the, it's the meeting, it's the meeting of the minds, right? It's kind of like, it just gets the juices flowing. And then as we see over time, those people who did come in with, with very, with, with a small amount of knowledge that over time, they, it just starts to get deeper and deeper and deeper, and um, the conversations just become more more rich. Yeah. As, as well as learning more about human agency and the importance of that dimension to this topic from Lee and their survey at Pew, uh, we, we also heard uh, his, his thoughts around the, the accelerated shift uh, as these different versions of ChatGPT come, on, come online. 
Um, how are you going about preparing for this next wave of, of technology? Are you in, 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 you know, adding to your existing coursework? Are you adding new courses? What, what do you think the future is? And then I'd love to bring Lee back into our final few minutes of conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, chat um, GPT is, um, it's on fire. <laughs> and um, so I did mention in my presentation, um, the I and AI series that we're, um, that we're working on this year, um, which will include a component on chat. GBT. So this is where we will be bringing in um, experts in, in that area. Um, on top of that, um, as I mentioned, we are 100 branches and um, so uh, and a lot of employees. So we do have um, staff lunch and learns as well. And, um, and this is a chance for us to sort of bring in those new technologies. So bringing in an expert um in in what's i hate to say what's hot right but it, it, in a way that you know chat gpt is hot at the moment and um so it's bringing in experts to talk to our staff about it it's um you know getting everybody thinking about it and and then um empowering us so that we can actually go out there and, and confidently um talk about the subject Th thank you, um, Lee. We'll, we'll have you back in, and you know, I, I continue to be have deep respect for not just the work at Toronto and other public libraries around the U.S. and the globe that are doing different forms of digital literacy, but I think the research that happens at Pew keeps us uh, close to our, you know, having a finger on the pulse. Um, and certainly in the context of Urban Libraries Council, we, we have ongoing um, discussions about the role of public libraries with respect to these new challenges. Um, this may be a question for both of you is, how do you think the next wave of public libraries responding to this opportunity, what should that really look like? We had some great ideas and great work happening uh, from Fiona at Toronto, but maybe there's more beyond that. Yeah, I think Fiona's rundown was just brilliant, and um, and she's ser serving her community incredibly well. Um, one model to to be thinking about is is the changes that libraries already went through in embracing the internet as part of life. I mean, there there was a resistor cohort among librarians, but the many uh, knew that it was a, it was an opportunity, and it, it was an inevitability, and and um, so had to do it. So I think um, the first order of, of the kinds of things Fiona was talking about, of just being teachers, modelers, explainers, um, demystifiers is a, is, is, a, is, a, is a nice thing to do. The other, uh, the other thing I think is, is maybe suggested by some of the comments um, about librarians themselves being interveners with large language models or, to, or hiving off. There are going to be APIs. There are going to be ways in which uh, these models can be customized. You know, they'll certainly be co commercially customized. Lawyers will have their version. Uh, pediatricians will have their version. Uh, optometrists will have their version. Um, and so, why shouldn't librarians? And it's and it, and I think as a as a sort of a way in which to embed yourself usefully, and particularly in um, communities with access to higher levels of education, institutions nearby, this is a sort of natural alliance to be to cement even more. And to think about how there are ways in which the kind of sensibilities librarians bring to every encounter they have can be, um, there could be a librarian uh, GPT uh, as well. The, the other thing is sort of, um, I'm remembering the stories when ebooks first came into existence. And, the, and the, the, one of the heaviest traffic days, at least at some of the libraries I heard about right after Kindle and other e-readers uh, came into being was the, the day after Christmas was, became a heavy traffic day when people would walk in with their new device to librarians and say, fill her up, you know? And, and, and there are ways which librarians have always sort of served as, as sort of petting zoos for new technology. And I think there are, are ways there are ways now to sort of bring AI and, and those systems into that sensibility too. 
or they were bringing in their devices and how do I even use this? Not, yeah, exactly. not even how do I fill it up? So, yeah. uh, which we actually still see today because the digital divide I think remains remains very, very, very real. Uh, maybe the vision of your future is people will be walking in with the avatar they got for a, a, for a holiday uh, present and then how do I use this or what is this? So uh, Fiona, what do you think? Are we, are we up for this? I think so. Um, I, I love, and I, Dan, I agree with you. Heading zoos um, for new technology, but that's it, right? We just have to we have to incorporate now AI and make it so that um, that people understand exactly what it is and why it does what it does. Um, well, um, yeah. we're 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 right at uh, at the hour mark. I'm going to bring Don back in in a second to to close us out. But uh, well, unfortunately, we didn't have time to get into the whole research and academic side of the equation and what the future of reference might be. But these are conversations and questions I think we'll we'll uh, we'll continue to engage with. And um, I'm certainly reminded that you know there yes, there's a science fiction dimension to all of this, and I will take us back to the Star Wars Attack of the Clones movie when Obi-Wan Kenobi goes into the Jedi archives and two two refreshing things. One, his first interaction is still with the, with the human Jedi librarian. There's still a role for the human part of that. And then when his missing planet can't be found, he has to turn to the young people to work out what exactly um, uh, the problem was. So a little sense of humor, but I do think, um, you know, the human element here is essential. And even if we have to catch up, uh, we should probably um, make sure that we have room for it. Uh, Don, I'm bringing you back in uh, just to close us out. Fine, thank you, David. Thank you very much for playing this role. You've, you've helped this conversation tremendously. Uh, um, but your point about uh, science fiction is, I think it's right on uh, because I think so much of what's going on right now is the result of the mythology that is embedded in everybody. I, you know, I go back to uh, 1968, 2001, and Hal says, sorry, Dave, I can't do that. You know, okay. <laughs> so, uh, and there've been a whole series, you know, of, of uh, AIs, uh, you know, doing things on their own. Uh, so it's, it, in this point about the impact on libraries, this is, this is a new major chapter in the evolution of information technology which is, you know, the history of libraries. And so I think it's a natural role for libraries to try to make sense of it, to help people understand it, to explain it and teach it, and, um, uh, and, and really take a leadership role with this. Because I think we're all at sea, myself. I, you know, I think the internet is doing things that we don't yet appreciate what it's doing. And I think this is gonna accelerate that. Um, so it's a big challenge here for, for us all. Um, we're, we're over the hour just a little bit, but we started a little bit after, but I don't want to keep anybody, uh, uh, hang, hanging up here. So what I think we will do is, uh, close the recording and, uh, thank our, I'd also like everybody to, to unmute, if you would, please unmute, because if we were all together in the same room and we had three extraordinary presenters, please unmute everybody. We would we would thank them. We would we would give them a round of applause. So that's what we're going to do right now, everybody. Please uh, a hand for our presenters. Okay, okay. We we need to learn more how to do that. It's just it's it's something that really needs to be expressed. Is our appreciation for for what you've done today because I think you've moved the thing forward. Uh, as far as the professional impact, we did get into that with the last session in February. That link is on giglibraries.net. Uh, David Lankus led that discussion, and so that's more on the professional side, professional impact uh, of, of AI, and I uh, highly recommend that. And going back even further, a year earlier, there's another excellent session we did. Uh, so we will revisit this for sure, and uh, we're interested in where people think the most benefit may be, the most the biggest dangers may be that we can focus on and try to highlight. So uh, we'll, with that, we'll uh, thank you again and close the recording, but we'll stick around for a little uh, relaxed chat if anybody has time for it. Okay, close recording 